Welcome to Where's the Proof? Organizing and Writing Genealogical Findings. This is part one of three, Analyzing and Correlating Your Research. I'm Lisa Stokes, an accredited genealogist professional, accredited with ICAPGen in the Mid-South region of the United States. I'm also the study group leader for the ICAPGen Level 1 and the Level 2 and 3 study groups. For each part of this presentation, we only have 20 minutes. So my goal is to teach some basic skills to help you learn to write genealogy proofs. The ICAP Gen Level 1 report is written as if to a client. So the Level 1 requirements are great guidelines to help an emerging genealogist uh, learn to write client reports. This skill is also helpful for intermediate genealogists who want to share their research with others. Since we won't be covering the ICAP Gen requirements in great detail, those of you working on accreditation, you will need to download and print the guide to applying for an accredited genealogist credential, or we often call this the guide to accreditation for short. This guide can be found at the ICAP Gen website. The second goal we have is to give you some resources to help you improve your writing skills. So I have listed some resources for you in the syllabus. My favorite resource is a book by Thomas W. Jones called Mastering Genealogical Proof. I will be referencing a few of the chapters from there in the syllabus. GenProof is a study group that is based on the book Mastering Genealogical Proof. And it is arranged very similarly to ProGen, if any of you have done ProGen. I've been through ProGen, and I highly recommend looking into this study group to help you learn to write proofs. I've broken down my presentation into three 20-minute parts, so be sure to watch all three. Before we begin, it's important to understand what a genealogy proof is and what it isn't. Let's start with what a gene genealogy proof is not. First of all, it's not a fun family narrative or story that chronologically tells about your family and all the different things that happen to them. It's also not a travelogue of your research. And it's definitely not just a list of the basic sources found. A written genealogy proof is a section of a research report documenting research findings about an event, about a fact, or about a relationship. A proof uses analysis and correlation to make and support a solid conclusion. There are three types of genealogy proofs. The lines between, that, between them are gray, and the information that I'm covering in this video applies to all three of these in varying degrees. Please refer to the syllabus for a few more specifics on the difference between proof statements, proof summaries, and proof arguments. So the topic for this section of the presentation is analyzing and correlating your research. But what exactly does it mean to analyze and to correlate your research? We're going to talk about analyzing first. When you're analyzing a source, its information and the evidence, it means that you are answering the questions about the reliability of those items. So what types of questions need to be answered? I like to think of the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So come up with questions such as who created the record? What type of source is it? Is it original? Is it a derivative source or is it an authored source? When was the source created? Was it created near the time of the event or was it created years later? This makes a difference. There, where was the record created? These are the types of questions that need to be answered as you are analyzing the material that you've uncovered in your research. So first, we want to go over some of the terminology to make sure that you understand it and make sure that you're using it correctly. So these next few slides give you a basic overview, but I have listed some more resources in the syllabus on this topic. If you are not familiar with this, this is something you really do need to understand. So a source is a document, a record, an artifact, or a book, or a person, 
And a source can be original, derivative, or authored. An original source is the original form of the record, artifact, document, to include any reliable digital copy of that source. A derivative source is any sort of copy, such as an official clerk's copy, or a transcription, an abstract, or an index of the original record. So the information has been copied. The reason it's, it's important to analyze this is that each time a copy is made, there's a potential for error. And this affects the reliability of the source. So this is something that the researcher needs to take into consideration. An authored source is any book or report or anything like that that was compiled by another researcher. Authored sources can be used for clues to help researchers, but in general, they're not used, used as if they're an original or even as if they're a derivative source. Okay, let's move on to information. Information is knowledge of dates, places, names, relationships, etc. And information can be primary, secondary, or undetermined. So it's important to note the use of this terminology. For example, a lot of times people try and say it's a primary source. And that would be an incorrect use of genealogy terminology. So you would need to use the term original source or primary information. Primary information means that the informant was a witness of or had firsthand knowledge of the event or the relationship. Secondary information means that the informant was not a witness of the event or the relationship, but had only secondhand knowledge of that event or relationship. So they were told by somebody else, basically. Undetermined information means that the researcher cannot tell if the information is primary or secondary. And moving on to evidence. Evidence is the relevance of the information to answering a research question. Evidence can be direct, indirect, or negative. Direct evidence is basically a direct statement that answers the question. So the source contains that direct statement. For example, a birth record directly, directly stating that the birth date of an individual is a certain date. Indirect evidence is when two or more pieces of information that when combined can lead to an answer. So an example of this would be a man and a woman listed together in, in the 1850 through the 1870 censuses where a relationship is not explicitly stated. It can only be implied that this man and woman are married. We don't know for sure. They may be a brother or sister living with nieces and nephews instead of a husband and wife with children. But if that piece of evidence that's indirect is correlated with other evidence, the source or the researcher may be able to come to a solid conclusion that that, that, that couple is a man and wife and not a brother and sister. Negative evidence is missing information or evidence that leads to an answer of the research question. So an example is when someone disappears from the census records with their family, this may indicate that they are deceased. Uh, not always, but it could. Negative evidence always needs to be layered with, with other evidence in order to be proven true. So you can't assume that that person, because they're not in the census, is deceased. You must have other evidence that backs that up. But having that negative, negative evidence can add weight to your argument that that person is deceased. The purpose in going through these terms is to remind you that you need to use them correctly when you are writing your genealogy proofs. Our next topic is we need to gather and catalog each source in a research log. It's really important that we have a place to keep the information we gathered. If it's just in our head or floating around on scraps of paper, it doesn't do us any good. The type of research log that you use is up to you. 
and we don't have time to go into the use of research logs here, but you can see the syllabus for some guidance. If you're working on a level one project, also refer to the guide to accreditation for research log requirements. The key to successfully using a research log is to find what works for you. Then carefully record each source found in the research log and then cull or gather every clue and detail found in each source. Be sure to include a proper and full source citation in the research log that will lead back to that source. And consider making some analysis and correlation in the research log. This makes the research log a very useful tool when it comes time to write the report. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little more specifically now about culling each source for the important clues. And the next few slides will, slides will give you some brief examples of culling each source for those clues to help you come to a solid conclusion. One of the first things you can do is to abstract the sources as you find them. And you want to abstract every detail that you can find. And you want to catalog each of those facts or clues in the research log. You can also make a separate chart to correlate the clues if that's needed, if it's something that's in, um, in depth. And then you want to synthesize that in evidence and start thinking about it and start putting it all together in your own mind and in your research log. Here's a blank copy of the 1900 census form. And it gives lots of valuable information. Most of the census forms do, as do a lot of other sources. So it's really important that you know and understand what sort of information you can gather from these sources. So in the 1900 census, here's a list of all the clues that you could gather from it. Two of my favorites that I use often from this census would be the month and year of birth is listed. It's the only census where that's so. And also another really important one is the women were asked how many children have been born to them and how many are still living. So then you're gonna to want to record that in the research log. This is a research log entry for the Lizzie Wallen household in the 1900 census. Notice that it has a full source citation and it has a results column where the information is cataloged into the research log. And then I like to have a notes or conclusion column. And this is where I start to do some initial analysis. If you are watching this as a recording, be sure to pause that and read some of those details. And this is these are details that would be for your own use and might not necessarily make it into the final report. And they don't need to be perfect either. Just gather your thoughts here. This is a close up of this cell on this spreadsheet. Okay, let's talk a little bit about transcriptions. When you come across a document such as a deed or a probate that needs to be transcribed, you want to do so carefully. And then you want to analyze the source and pull every bit of information that you can from it. And you wanna do that in a line by line analysis of that document. Then you're gonna catalog each fact or clue. And again, you're gonna synthesize the evidence there. So here's an example. This is a 1755 deed between Young Stokes and Sylvana Stokes of Lunenburg County, Virginia. This source is part of a very complicated case that I've been working on for a while now. And I've gathered over 100 deeds, probates and tax records from the Stokes families living in Lunenburg County, Virginia area. I'm trying to discover who my husband's sixth great grandfather is. The first thing I did was write a citation for it as I found the source and cataloged it in my research log, which I'll show you in a minute. And then I made a transcription of it. And I created this in a Word document. And a little bit further down on the page, I have an abstract of this document. So after I transcribed it, I abstracted it. And then I like to make notes and I call it gathered evidence. 
And I just try and I sit and go through the abstract, every single point by point, and I just catalog those on the transcription itself. Then I like to move it to the research log, which I'll talk about here in a second. The next thing that you need to be aware of is the importance of correlating the sources, information, and evidence. And it's great to do this in your research log as well. Correlation means to compare the information and evidence found in each source to determine its accuracy. So here is that abstract again. And notice that we have, I have a square around the gathered evidence. And I want to show you what I do with it. So I just copy it and then I paste it into my research log. Now, this is the first half of this very detailed research log. Most research logs are not going to be this detailed, but this project has become so vast that I have a very detailed research log because I have family members helping me transcribe and all sorts of things going on. So this is the first half. You'll see the citation right here. Then as we move to this columns further to the right on this document, my very last column is my conclusions column. And I have just pasted all of the, that gathered evidence into this research log. Then I can read through every document that I have. And at this point, I have about 50 of them transcribed. I can read through it and start thinking about how things fit together and try and dissect all of these five families and figure out who is who. Another tool that I like to use is a mind map. A mind map is really helpful when you're trying to correlate sources or you're synthesizing the information and the evidence that you found. It can help you track very complicated information I created this mind map from scratch using a program called Lucid Sparks, which is a program that's available through Lucid Chart. There's a link to this website in the syllabus. This particular mind map shows the clues that I have gathered so far for the relationships of young Stokes. And you'll see his sticky note is right there in the middle. And here's a close up. The sticky notes represent individuals. All the yellow ones represent people who are possible relatives to young. Then you'll see the blue boxes and the blue boxes represent the actual source. So we talked earlier about the 1755 deed. All of the white boxes represent the evidence and the information that was found within that source. It helps me correlate with all the other sources that I found because they, it gets really complicated. The solid lines represent possible family relationships and the dotted lines represent more of fan club type relationships. So the last item that I wanna talk about is making an evidence analysis chart to practice your analysis and correlation skills. If you have not done this before, it's a great exercise to do to help you. I do not do this on every project that I do, but I've done it enough times now that I understand where I'm going and what I need to be doing, but it is a great exercise. So these gray bars have been merged and they represent the source. Then I have some analysis of the source and a column for the analysis of the information and a column for the analysis of the evidence. This type of detailed chart is for your own reference and does not need to be perfect. It can help you brainstorm ideas for the rough draft report. It's a great learning experience that helps you think through the analysis of the sources found. And most of all, remember that not all ideas that you come up with should land in the final report. Thank you for watching part one of this presentation. Be sure to watch parts two and three and don't forget to download the syllabus. And if you have questions, you can contact me at this email address. Thank you. Have a great day.